What would the world's most productive man do during a pandemic? How would he navigate the changing times that we're going through right now? Well, you're going to find out in this episode because I'm interviewing one of my mentors, Craig Ballantyne, aka the world's most productive man. Welcome to the Affiliate Guy Podcast. If you want to grow your income, serve your tribe, and enjoy all the benefits of affiliate marketing and having your own affiliates, you're in the right place. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. So I am super excited about this episode because I've got on one of my mentors, a guy that I've known for years who's been one of our top affiliate partners for numerous clients, uh, for some of our stuff. He's written multiple books that I absolutely love. Since recording this episode, he sent me some of his new books that we talk about in the episode and I've had a chance to read those. And I'm going to tell you, they were uh, like, I didn't think it was possible for Craig to, to pour more into my life. And yet he has. Uh, His book, Unstoppable, is absolutely amazing. The Perfect Week Formula, absolutely amazing. Uh, The workouts that he put me through over the years and gave me access to those. I mean, just uh, the Perfect Day Formula, unbelievable. And and he's right, though. He says it in the interview, the Perfect Week Formula is like a million times better. Uh, It's like a thousand times better. But, I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. This guy is oozing wisdom and oozing calm amidst the chaos He's been nicknamed the world's most productive man, and you'll see why in this interview. And he's going to help us navigate these crazy times, what's going on in the world, and how to still be productive. You know, maybe you've got kids at home. Maybe you're homeschooling for the first time. Maybe you're you're working from home with kids at home, and you're homeschooling, and you're caring for maybe somebody who's high risk, and maybe you're not able to leave the, the house as much, and, and all these things. Like since recording this episode... I've I've had surgery and I'm recovering from surgery. And one of the things is I'm not really allowed to leave our property because I don't need to get into the reasons, but basically I can't be far from home Uh, with at the risk of being crass. uh, I don't have control over some of my bodily functions for the next, you know, two to three weeks. I can't, I shouldn't really leave the house and um, shouldn't leave the property at least. And so I've been kind of confined to the house for the last couple of weeks. And, you know, I'm telling you, it, it definitely messes with your psyche. The other day I was finally like, hey, I, I took care of business. I got to go. I got to like, we just, let's go for a drive for 20 minutes. Let's just leave the house. And we did. And I felt safe doing that, you know, but no long trips, no, no vacations, no going, you know, to, to the soccer fields or anything like that for a few weeks. And I know, like, I feel like the people who've been quarantined, you know, it kind of feels that way. Same feeling. Have I literally, outside of that 20 minute drive, have not left our property in two weeks and I'm going a little crazy. How do you navigate that? Well, Craig is going to help with that. Craig Ballantyne, again, just an amazing person. I've got links to his websites in the show notes. You want to check those out. And I don't want you to miss any, I, I don't want you to have to wait any longer to listen to this. So I'm going to cut right to my interview with the world's most productive man, Craig Ballantyne. Well, welcome, Craig. Hey, this is going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Man, it's so good to uh, so good to finally do this. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, I mean, Craig, you and I connected first at least in 2015. It might even have been like 2014 uh, in a Ray Edwards affiliate promotion. I mean, it yeah. was so long ago. And I just wanted to publicly, you know, with you on, acknowledge you before we get into to talking today um, for your generosity. Um, I mean, it's, I'm holding here. In fact, we want, it's one of the things we want to talk about. I'm holding a, a kit that Craig sent me, I don't know, probably three years ago. Yeah. I'm almost out of, of parts of it. I've used it so much uh, that you sent me with the book. And when, you know, Craig was like, Hey, can I send you a book? I'm like, well, of course. I mean, you know, I, 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 I like you. I love your stuff. I'd love your book. And then he doesn't just send a book. It's like a book plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus a bunch of other stuff that I've already thrown away because I've used it. So, um, dude, I just want to acknowledge you for that, that generosity. I know that's a big part of where, why you've gotten where you've gotten in life. Well, you know, it's something when you have something and you're proud of it, you just want to get in everybody's hands. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's a kit that helps people make the most of their days. And 
you know, it's my life's work in a box and I've been fortunate enough that I was able to figure out how to do that. And then I just get it in the hands of many, many people. And you know, if I can, if I can help somebody get an extra hour a day, man, I mean, some people can make, make huge shifts with that. I would say that's about what you got for me. Cool. Believe it or not. I, I think, um, I know that for me, I used to always hit five o'clock and go, Oh crap. I have about 45 minutes left. And now I'm hitting five o'clock going, I have one thing left. Or sometimes I'm hitting five fifteen with no things left and I just stop working. Yeah. And I'll tell you that it's in large part due to you. Um, oh, and that is cool. a really cool feeling when it used to always be five, you know, five forty five. I'm texting my wife. Hey, I just need 15 more minutes. I just need 15 yeah. more minutes. So it really just became six o'clock. You know, yeah, because you know, like that can build up and yeah. and cause a lot of problems. We can cut, we can talk about cutoff times. I'm talking a lot about cutoff times with my coaching clients these days and the importance of it, not just for the end of your day, but for meetings, you know, for podcasts, for phone calls, for workouts, you know, for all these things that can otherwise bleed into your day and just rob you of time. And then you get home a little late and that's, you know, the, the, the mole hill that adds up to the next mole hill that becomes a mountain over time. And I've seen that, you know, lead to explosions in some people's lives. Yeah. So actually, you know what we said, we were going to start kind of when we were chatting beforehand, I was like, let's start with the beginning of the day, but actually let's just go there since we were just talking about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I know that's been huge for me. And, and I think it's more of an issue. I, I think you would, you say you've been talking a lot about it with your clients lately. It's probably cause it's more of an issue here in the middle of, you know, the, the pandemic, um, with more and more people working from home full-time, part-time, you know, whatever. Um, are you seeing that? Are you seeing an increase in that like blurring of like when a cutoff time is versus before the pandemic? Well, yeah. I mean, now there's no separation between work and home life. And, and, you know, so there's that phrase, I don't know if it's in your constitution again, I'm Canadian, so I don't know exactly, but you know, that separation of church and state, I don't know if that's, you know, whatever it's in. And I've always written about the separation of work and home life and whether, you know, so I was talking to a guy yesterday. He, he's, you know, he can't go to his office. He's a fractional CFO. So he does the CFO services to SaaS companies. And he's like, he's like, Craig, I've read about how in your book, you know, like I, I have to transition from the home office to going out and being super dad. And, you know, I'm, I'm having a little struggle with that right now. Because, you know, he's going out of the room several times a day into where the kids are playing because the kids are at home and everybody's at home. And we, ha- you know, we end up having a lot more interactions with our, our spouses, our partners, our kids, and there isn't that separation. And so what we need to do is, you know, so I actually stole this one thing from Jack Canfield. He had a great thing that he worked at home and he had a hat on. And every time Jack had the hat on, it was don't bother Jack. You know, it's like Jackson work mode. And it's like something so simple, like, you know, that's goofy or whatever. No, but something so simple because, you know, you might have an incident with your spouse where they're like, they think you came out to the kitchen because you're done or something. No, but you're like in deep thinking mode mm-hmm. about a thing and you just want a glass of water or whatever it is. And then they're, they, they talk to you and you're like, ah, yeah, not now. And, and just like, oh, okay. And then, then, you know, later on at dinner, there's tension and, and so like that simple hat trick is, is very, very powerful. So we want to have that separation between work life and home life, even if we are always at home. And so the cutoff times for the end of the day, they need to be hard and fast. They need to have rituals that allow you to go from, you know, entrepreneur hat on to super mom or super dad hat on or whatever it is in your life, because yeah, and, and if you're not married, you don't have kids, you don't have any dependents, well, you can do what I did when I was younger, which is let everything work-related film, fill the vacuum of time, and therefore you work yourself into burnout, and I don't know if I want to call it burnout or whatever, but I, I worked too much and I played too much and I had anxiety attacks because mm-hmm. there was no cutoff, there was no separation, there, it was all a gray area, and there needs to be some black and white. And so the first thing to do is start with, I'm done at this time, no exceptions. And now here, here, Matt, is where uh, people have the, the problem of, yeah, I'm just going to text her or text him that it's going to be another 15 minutes or whatever, because they say there's a cutoff, 
but there is no cutoff because mm-hmm. if you're saying, oh yeah, I'll be, I'll be there an extra 15 minutes. Well then, then there really has been no cutoff. So what I've realized is everybody needs significant consequences for any statements that they make. So if you say, mm-hmm. and, and so the consequences, you know, for some people it might be a $50 payment. I've had, I've had clients donate $500 to Bernie Sanders because they didn't get up at six o'clock in the morning one day. And you better believe that they ain't doing that again because, yeah. you know, and obviously that's not their favorite guy. It uh, wasn't their favorite horse in the race back then. And so it's, if you have no significant consequences, sure. Arguing with your spouse in three months from now, because of something that you do for the next 90 days that, you know, betrays them or upsets them is a significant consequence, but it's three months from now. But if there is a significant consequence to you not doing something now, then you will pay more attention to it. Like for another example, just a quick example, Matt, is that a client of mine said, Again, I'm going on social media too much. And I'm like, okay, eight o'clock is your cutoff time. And if you say to your um, world, he's a fitness expert, you know, he helps fitness people. He said, you go to your Facebook group and you say, if anybody catches me liking, sharing, commenting on this platform or other platforms after 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, then I owe you $50. And you better believe that's going to stop somebody from doing something pretty quickly as opposed to, I'm really trying not to. Yeah. Yeah. Those are totally different. Uh, In a moment, I want to talk about the, um, some, some things that people can do to make that transition. You mentioned that transition. And I think when you have a commute, there's a, there's a baked in transition that I used to have of about 12 to 13 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll never forget, like I used to, if I needed, if I needed an extra three minutes, I would just drive past the house, go up to the roundabout, come back. And it gave me an extra three minutes just to, to decompress. But I think one of the things I noticed um, to what you were just saying, you know, when I was texting and asking for another 15 minutes and, you know, my wife, I mean, she's, she was great about that. It still happens occasionally. Um, but it's, it's usually because something happened at five o'clock that was unanticipated. And it's rare enough that, you know, that we're good with it. But one of the things I know that I noticed after I stopped doing it was that when I was texting every day and not uh, holding to my, you know, my time, um, it warped how I thought of myself. Mm-hmm. I, I no longer thought of myself as somebody who keeps their word. Yeah. And thankfully that, I, I didn't let that go into a slippery slope into other stuff, but I would imagine for some people that could go into a slippery slope for other things. Well, I don't keep my word. So, you know, am I going to step out of my wife? Am I going to, you know, cheat on a business deal, like whatever it may be. And it's those little, those little tiny hinges that swing the big doors. I think that's the danger in it. Yeah. And, and there's some people that will, you know, the sense of, feeling like a hypocrite is enough to stop somebody from doing something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so for me, like I'm a big believer in the power of public accountability. Like I put up and non-negotiables, you know, like things yeah. like it is non-negotiable for me to shut my phone off at 6 PM Pacific standard time during the weekdays. I post it on my social media, on my main social media feed. Like I'm telling the world. And if I told the world that I'm going to do X and, and one day I'm on at seven o'clock, boy, do I feel like a hypocrite and feeling like a hypocrite is one of the worst feelings that you can have. Mm. So it's powerful when you do this. Like I was actually able to quit cursing in a social environment by simply telling my email list back when I was doing the fitness stuff, you know, back in 2011, I did this. I emailed my list of 150,000 people. I said, I'm not going to swear anymore. And I was able to stop swearing in four days and pretty much, you know, keep that off that, you know, I don't swear on stage. I don't swear on podcasts. I don't, swear when I'm in conversation with, with people who are at a mastermind or anything. I just don't. And it was because I said this and my brain wants to act in congruence with the image that I give and uh, portray myself to the world and the things that I say. And so some people will have that as that's a strong enough consequence for other people. You might have to go and do the, you know, punishment, for a little bit, but as James Clear says in his book, Atomic Habits, you just want to change your identity. Yeah. So you change your identity. I'm the type of person who keeps my word to my wife that I go home at five o'clock unless there's a legitimate emergency. Great, great. That 
identity, staying, saying that identity, committing to that identity, sharing that with her, that, that can be pretty good guardrails for you being successful with that. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. Those are, you mentioned you were in the fitness world. Have you found that those are probably the two big keys for, um, for weight loss and other fitness goals as well? Public accountability and non-negotiables? Public accountability is huge, but I would say the most powerful one, like public accountability is kind of like icing on the cake. I mean, it really, you know, when, when you get going, it keeps you going, Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, you go back to the real reason is the meaningful incentive. So I actually had, there's five pillars for success, which I stole from my fat loss transformation business. And I realized it applied to anything, whether you want to become a great speaker, a great affiliate manager, a great entrepreneur, a great father, a great anything, is you need better planning and preparation than ever before. And I talk about this in in the Perfect Day book. You need better Mm -hmm. planning and preparation than ever before. You've had a plan before. You didn't stick to it. It's just like with meal planning, you know, like people have a plan to eat well this week. Well, that's kind of a plan. But if you do all your cooking on Sunday, that's a real plan, you know. So better planning. Then professional accountability. And in the weight loss world, there was a study way back in the 90s from Stanford that said, if you're accountable to a professional, like a doctor, a nurse, personal trainer, you're going to have better results than if you're just accountable to a friend because they kind of let you off. Then then the third thing is social support. You simply need to be around like-minded people who lift you up when you're feeling down. It's kind of like, I use the analogy here. Uh, if you're running a marathon, you have a coach who wrote the program. That's professional accountability. And then you have the people on the side of the road who, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. I mean, that's not real professional advice. You know, you yeah. can do it, but you need it when you're running up the hill on mile 18. Then the fourth pillar is the one, the meaningful incentive, the meaningful incentive. Because I ran these contests, Matt, we would have thousands of people enter. It was free to enter. I was paying the winners a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks. We did a lot of these, you know, 18, 20 of these. And, and they could use any of my programs that they could find for free online, enter for free, win my money. And they wanted to lose weight. You know, I was paying them to do a goal. 80% of people don't make it past two weeks. And you would look at them and you go, well, listen, you're, you don't have kids. You, you know, you do have weight to lose. You have a gym membership, you even have a trainer and you dropped out. And yet here's the the guy or gal who's single, recently divorced, three kids, really overweight, 40 or 50 years old, super busy. And they're the ones that finished. Why is that? Oh, because, you know, I am recently divorced and single or, you know, my doctor said I won't be around for my kid's graduation. Oh, Mm -hmm. oh, you, when you have the why as the old, I think it's just Nietzsche. Uh, when you have the why, you can bear any yeah, how. Yeah. And most people don't really have the why. And this is you know, so true of entrepreneurship, right? You hear about somebody, well, I was, I was in e-com for three months, and I was a real estate agent for three months, and then, you know, then I was this for three months, and none of them ever worked. Well, of course none of them work. Like, how are any of those going to work in three months? And so you see people bouncing around because they don't have a real reason why. Like, like Sarah Blakely was Spanx. I couldn't find anything. I hated everything. So I created my own and I want to go help women, you know, transform their confidence with mm-hmm. these legging things or whatever they are. Okay. That's a real reason why. Yeah. And, and so on and so Absolutely. forth. So, so those things, you know, that was the fourth one. The fifth one is also really, really magical, which is a deadline. Right. And there's a dead, you know, we were talking about deadlines for our days to start off. And if you don't have a cutoff time, you know, Parkinson's law kicks in where the time, mm-hmm the time allotted uh, or the work will expand to fill the time allotted for the task. You know, when we were in college and the professor said, March 21st is your deadline. We got it done March 20th at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, (laughs) If if he had, if he or she had said March 14th, we would have magically got it done a week early. So, so it's the same with our work and our stuff. And so Dan Kennedy, I'm sure you're you're familiar with Dan and all his many Mm -hmm. teachings. I mean, he's got so many gems and nuggets, but, one of the ones that's overlooked by a lot of people is you need cutoff times for every meeting you go into, every phone call you have. I mean, this guy was, if there's anybody more ruthless with his time, it was Dan. And, you know, just, and it was like, oh, you know what? You're right. Like you go to a meeting with like, let's meet for coffee. And, you know, like, let's say you're at a mastermind meeting or a big, uh, you know, traffic and conversion. You're like, yeah, okay. I'll meet you at, uh, 
at 11 o'clock out in front of the Starbucks. And then you stop there and you're like, you get in this conversation and you're like, man, I, I, I thought I was going to meet that other person. Like, how do I get out of this right now? Or like, oh man, there goes two hours of my day. And yeah, it was a good conversation, but it could have been 30 minutes. And it's like, well, all you need to do is say in advance. And this is how I, 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 I phrase it, Matt, so that everybody's like, uh, you know, wins from this is I say, Hey Matt, yeah, sure. I'll meet you at 11 o'clock. I know you're super busy and you have a ton of other people to meet. So we'll just, you know, I'll only take 20 minutes of your time. We'll run by 1120. Uh, here's the agenda. You know, we'll just get to know each other for a few minutes, but we'll make sure that we cover, um, you know, the thing for Ray Edwards or Michael Hyatt or, you know, some of many of the things that you, you, uh, we involved, yeah. we got involved with, with you. Uh, we'll make sure that we have the exact plan and that we done by 1120 so that we, that, uh, you know, you can get off to your next meeting. I don't want to hold you up. So I'm just saying, like, I'm protecting my time, but I'm saying to you, I know you're busy. I know mm-hmm. you need to, and it's like, they go, yeah, I am busy. <laughs> and I need to get off to that thing. And then you have an agenda and you guys go in there and, you know, you, you still have plenty of time to be personable and everything, but it, it moves everything ahead faster. And yeah, you probably just saved each of you 40 minutes, which allows you to have, do three more, you know, two more deals in an hour or whatever. Yeah. And, and we did that right before we, we went live here. You know, uh, I mean, the truth is, yeah, I want to respect your time, but I also have a, a cutoff. But mm-hmm. I turned it to you and said, when do you have a cutoff? So now when, when I'm cutting us off at, you know, about, let's just say we go to 53 after the hour because you told me five before the hour, it's on you. You're the reason why I'm cutting it short now. Now I've told you now, of course, but, right. you know, and, and I, love, I love that, you know, how ruthless – Dan was with his time. Um, and, and I don't know where I got this. It might have even been from you because I just heard how you said, you know, 1120, you know, we'll be done at 1120. I don't know where I got this from, but I got in the habit probably about a year ago of all of my appointments are either 25 or 55 minutes long. They're never a half hour, an hour, because for some reason, mentally, to me at least, and to a lot of other people I've experienced, a half hour, an hour feels like an arbitrary amount of time, whereas 25 mm-hmm. minutes or 55 minutes feels like an intentional amount of time. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, and, and you, thing, hear about, you hear about companies like our meeting is at 9.07 because, yeah. okay, if it's at 9.07, it's 9.07. It's not, you know, nine-ish. Uh-huh. And um, my mom always makes fun of me for stuff like that, but I grew up playing golf. I played in golf tournaments. And in golf, if you have a tee time at 12.08, you don't show up at 12.10. You are now late. It is a two-shot penalty. If you show up after 12.13, you are disqualified from the entire tournament. And so I got in the habit of, you know, like before smartwatches and all that, like I knew what time it was. When I got to the golf course, I asked the starter, you know, thankfully by then I had a cell phone, but I asked the starter, what time do you have? He said, 1142. I looked at my phone and my phone said 1141. Okay, now it's one minute ahead. He's at 1142. I'm going to be over here when my phone says 1205, not 1207. Not, you know, I mean, that's, it's, you know, and it just became ingrained in me. And that, I, I, I remember going to an event, uh, it was a Stansberry research event and they had Penn, uh, Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller. It was the first time I ever heard this, but it's a classic phrase. And he says, to be early is to be on time, to be on time is to be late, and to be late is unforgivable. And I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> you know, I like you know Who also said. said that? My seventh grade band teacher. No way. He said that exact same thing. And I have quoted that so many times. And um, it's good. You so know, it really times. is. In most cases, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back real quick to the meaningful incentive. Um, you know, for me, uh, I, I've been on this journey, um, down about 80 pounds of fat now, you know, wow, uh, in the past year. And it was because the part of the catalyst was, uh, a guy said to me, uh, who, you know, became a dear friend. He's in our mastermind. He's a, you know, he's essentially like a, he's a coach to me now. And he said, listen, if you continue down this path, um, somebody else is going to walk your daughter down the aisle. Wow. And I could see it. Like I could see that and went, that, that ain't going to happen. You know, I'm not going to say exactly what the words that went through my mind, but uh, I'm, I'm going to abide by your, your commitment there. There you go. Uh, but it went through my mind. I was like, there is no way that is happening. So what do I got to do? You know, and that was, that was the thing is like the meaningful incentive of, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 80 years old and not be like an 80 year old who people know is 80 years old. I want to be an 80 year old and people think, well, he, what, he's 80? 
you know, that's the meaningful incentive, even at 41, you know, mm -hmm. for, like it's what I'm doing now at 41 directly impacts what's going to happen then. And so, um, but let's just say you, you don't have kids. You don't have, uh, you know, maybe you're not even married that you are going back to like a, you know, a single 28 year old who's looking for a meaningful incentive uh, for some, you know, BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. Where do they find those? Like what, what's the inner thing in them that they need to, to find that? I, well, I don't know exactly, but it's definitely possible. I mean, look at uh, the, t you know, some of the teenagers in this world. So there's like Greta Thunderbird or whatever. I, I don't mm -hmm. know how to pronounce her last name, yeah. but you know, you know, so this woman, this young lady, young woman, whatever you want to uh, mention that as, you know, she's 16, 17, you know, is doing the walkouts of school in Sweden and, you know, the environment is her cause. So it's clear that one can develop it at an early age. For me, I don't know how it came about. And I, for a long time, really didn't know how to properly describe it. But I always just got super frustrated at seeing people frustrated with achieving a goal that seems otherwise simple to do. And, you know, it, it morphed first into, you know, helping people transform in weight loss. Now, today, it's helping people, you know, get more done, work less, grow their business faster, simplify and streamline things. And so, you know, you certainly do have some natural talents and tendencies. Um, you know, when I take the strength finders test, you know, it's like, it's clear. I like strategy. I like vision. I like learning. I like execution. And that comes naturally to me. So things that I'm going to be naturally good at, I'm going to go and spend more time on. And then there's probably some life incident that is going to propel you in that direction. And you just need to be cognizant of being able to connect the dots looking back or and then thinking okay well this is what i'm really into and finding the problem that you want to go and solve and so it's a lot of it is is doing a lot of learning and getting a lot of life experiences and be okay with not rushing in and forcing something um you know i'm having a lot of conversations i, I talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs, people that want to become entrepreneurs. I get a lot of messages on Instagram and I answer almost all of them, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kids who want to become millionaires. And, and I say, and they ask me what to do. And I say, the first thing that you should do is something that I lucked into doing when I was 12 is go work for the best entrepreneur in your town. And they don't like that answer. Of course, they're like, how do I find this person? Uh, what does that even mean? And I'm like, this does now become not my job. This is on you. But I worked for the best entrepreneur in my town. I, I saw how he treated people, how hard he worked, how strategic he was, how he treated the, not just the customer, but the team member. And I was like, oh, okay, this is how you do it. And then I was able to apply that to the thing that I want to do, which was help people be in less pain, I suppose. So I don't know exactly how someone finds that meaningful incentive, yeah. but I tell you what, you got to keep searching until you find it. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think you may have just touched on it. Um, you know, Tony Robbins, I mean, this would be before he was married, before he had kids, he just decided he wanted, he wanted to do everything in his power to end suffering in people because he had suffered so much. And so his, you know, his meaningful incentive was to see in someone else avoiding what he went through, you know, the hell that he went through as a child. Um, and I mean, maybe, maybe that's it. It's find the thing that you struggled with, but you found success at and your meaningful incentive is to help, you know, could be a thousand people, 10,000 people, hundred thousand people um, do the same thing, you know? And I think well, that's where, that's where all the, all the perfect day stuff came from is yeah. I was, I was very unhappy with waking up late and not getting around to doing the things. So I started building the systems and formulas to go from, you know, a guy, I was, I was successful in spite of myself, but I wanted to figure out, well, how could I be successful and less stressful and started building a whole bunch of things that I still like, I'm always coming up with new things now because I'm very fascinated with it and I get so much input and data from people. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially it is mm -hmm. most of the best businesses are from a personal, a person with their own problem going and fixing it. Sarah Blakely, mm -hmm. great example. And then, you know, and then making sure that it's a big enough problem that when you solve it for enough people, it becomes uh, financially feasible. 
Yeah. And I mean, it's a better story too. I mean, uh, what I love about the book is that the, the first little bit of the book, and, and I know like we were just talking about Bedros's book as well, Man Up, it's, they're both the same in that they start off with like the lowest point of your life mm-hmm. and how you came up out of it. That's, I mean, that's what, half of Hollywood scripts? You that's know? A, yeah, it's a hero's journey, a right? Better, you know, inciting incident, lowest of low, uh, find the mentor and, yeah. and, you know, the thing that gets you back up. It's the Lord of the Rings, essentially, in biography mm-hmm. format. If, if your fitness story is, yep, I've actually always been in really good shape. I was a division one college athlete and I stayed in great shape throughout my twenties and thirties. And now I'm 40 and I want you to be in shape. That's a terrible story. You know, the story <laughs> I actually is, had a terrible story for a long time because, yeah. you know, when I was the fitness expert, I was this young guy who was always fit and people would be like, you don't really understand. And I never, I never really did, mm-hmm. but you know, fortunately just, I worked so hard and got so many success stories that now I could co-opt their story. Well, I've helped the person just like you. And, you know, that led to us getting more. But there's a guy, a friend of mine, a guy named Drew Manning. Have you ever heard of his fit to fat to fit story? Yeah, yeah I, I know his story very well. Yeah. And I mean, you know, for people that don't, he gained, I don't know how many pounds, whether it was a lot. Yeah. 50, 100 pounds. He became very overweight from being that very fit individual that Matt described, you know, like the Division One athlete. And, you know, he got on a lot of media for it. And I think he did it probably a decade ago. But people still remember him for that. And he was like, he just had so many ahas and revelations that, yeah, I mean, you, it's not necessarily that you have to have an artificial, not that that was an artificial story, but it was, you know, certainly different than the person who found themselves over it. Like, you know, he, like, however you got to that situation, like you yep. certainly have a better understanding of a journey than somebody who has not been on that journey. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, I think I think that's powerful, and I think if your incentive is to just help people avoid that, that's that's super powerful. So I want to go back to this idea of a perfect day, um, and I want to focus on the beginning because, of course, I mean it goes without saying, you know, I think what's the the, the hour of power? You know, it's like it it sets the tone. How your first hour goes, I know this from playing golf growing up. That if I was, if I, I was always intentional. I, I, I moved slow. Why? Because you don't want to move fast on a golf course. You know, I woke up and I went, I was very intentional about the things, but as I got into the work from home, I control my schedule. I don't have a nine thirteen tea time anymore. You know, it's like eh, my first meetings at noon. So that means I can just do whatever I want for a few hours. You know, I got, I got away from that discipline and that focus in the morning until I read perfect day formula. So let's focus on that like first hour or so in the morning. Uh, what does that look like for you? And then what are some of the, the things people can do to just get their day started off on the right foot? So I will, I will give this specific. Sometimes I don't yeah. like it because people go, Oh, well, I can't do that. Or mm-hmm. again, my morning yeah. is not your morning. Mm-hmm. And remember this phrase, it's not about the hour that you get up. It's about what you do with the hours that you are up. Okay? Mm-hmm. So it's not about the hour that you get up. And, and I actually think the 5 a.m. club is a ridiculous idea for a lot of people, especially people that are in the 7 a.m. club right now. You don't go to the 5 a.m. club overnight. You shouldn't. It's a bad idea. You're only mm-hmm. going to end up hating the idea of the 5 a.m. club. Um, you know, for example, like when I, when I was at my kind of lowest of the lows with the anxiety attacks, I was getting up at 7.30 in the morning, which to some people might seem early, but there are people who just love early mornings, and I'm one of them. And I wanted to do so many things in the morning. So I'd get up at 7.30 in the morning, roll over and make the mistake of checking my phone for email, and the anxiety starts right away because you know I'm already late mentally, and now I'm doing something that puts me back. So I actually started getting up I remember the day I said, five minutes earlier tomorrow, I'm going to get up five minutes earlier. That's it. Not 5 a.m. I'm going to get up five minutes earlier. And I'm going to take an extra five minutes until I look at my email. Quick wins, little wins that gave me momentum and motivation. And I did that for a week. Very much like I eventually started doing meditation after quitting on it several times. And instead of me doing five, 20, 15 minutes the first time, I said one minute for a week, one minute and then two minutes, mm. and then three minutes. And so, so back to my morning routine, I get up at 3.57 a.m. Just because it's kind of like the golf tee time, right? Like it's just yeah. like, why 3.57? 
It's three minutes uh, before The Rock, and it's 12 minutes after Mark Wahlberg, who gets up at 3.45 a.m. Uh, but I just chose 3.57 a.m. because, again, now it's like it's not an arbitrary thing. It's a, it's a thing. So I get up there. Yeah. I think and, that, I'll, I'll say something there. Yeah. I think it's because it's three minutes before four. It's like you feel like you gained. I don't know if you woke up. Even if it's yeah, even if it was three fifty nine, you still mode. feel that way. Yeah, you're in go mode, and it's like if you wake up three minutes, it kind of lets you do the things that let's be honest, everybody does first thing in the morning. I mean, we all go to the bathroom, right? And now it's four o'clock. <laughs> you know, so I think there could be some like little mental things there uh i didn't know i didn't even think about it that's why i wake up i think it's probably why i wake up when i wake up which is yeah. uh, I, i'm not a 5 a.m person but uh i wake up five minutes before the hour and i feel like i've already won I don't know. yeah so, exactly so, so ahead, you started so, 357 yeah and then so from there usually there, there's two slight variations to the morning i can either be at my desk working within 12 minutes of getting up or I will do, and then I'll work for a 90 minute block and do, a, and then do a short meditation. But right now I do get up and I do a very short meditation and then I take my dog outside uh, to go to the bathroom and then I come back in and I go to work. So usually it's about 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 till six is a work block um, and then around that time, my girlfriend gets up and we, we actually do a little dance and, you know, we're so excited in the morning to, uh, we're, we're very lucky. We live in Vancouver. It's very peaceful here. We have a very nice view of the water and the sun rises and the dog's a puppy. So, you know, she's high energy and we're all just really high energy at that time of day. And then I go back to work after about five minutes of goofing around. I have a meeting at seven o'clock in the morning that I have to prepare for. It's a marketing meeting that we do every single day running our Facebook ads. So I prep for that. And then after that, I'm out the door at around quarter to eight to the dog park. Uh, so because we got to get that dog tired as heck. Otherwise, the rest of the day is going to be spent trying to calm her down. So that, that's really the morning. And that morning is really all dictated the night before when we have that cutoff time. And that, that, that cutoff time the night before that is when you do a brain dump, which is getting all this stuff out of your head. You know, I got to call this person. I got to email this person. I got to, you know, write this sales letter. I got to do this. I got to prep for this call, this call, this call. Oh, I got to run these errands. I got to do this workout. Oh, you get it all out of your head. Brain dump it on the thing. So now you're going to feel better. Then you organize that into a priority to-do list because if you're doing your to-do list in the morning, you're already too late. And then mm -hmm. you make sure that you... Uh, I stole this one from Chip and Dan Heath. They said, if you want to make any habit easier, you got, just have to make the path to it smoother. So for example, I don't know if you did this, Matt, but when you were starting your fitness journey, when people are starting, they tend to say, I want to work out first thing in the morning. And then they wake up and they're like, oh my goodness, I don't want to get out of bed. And I don't know what to do for the workout. And I don't know, I have to go find some clothes to exercise. Well, that makes a, the path to success very difficult. So what you do is you know what workout you're going to do or you have to cue the video up or whatever it is and you have your shoes right there outside the bedroom and you have your workout clothes right beside, you know, yep. your bed and, and, you know, half begun is half done as Mary Poppins says. So, so that transfers over to our work. Like if I'm going to write a chapter for a book, I put down a couple of bullet points. If I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation, like for a webinar or something, I'm just going to do the first couple of slides. Because if I wake up, even as a disciplined entrepreneur, and I wake up and I go to the computer and I open it up and I go, okay, chapter two today, and it's a blank screen Doesn't looking work, at yeah. me. Yeah. 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 I mean, everybody becomes a procrastinator there. Yeah. In mo well, most people do. And so I call that process planning. So brain dump, priority to-do list, look at that number one and maybe the second one, do a couple of little things for it. So that, and then maybe even if you want to get into the magic of your subconscious mind, maybe your subconscious mind does some work overnight, you wake up the next morning and some of the work has been done and it flows out more. I'm a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. And that's how I design my evenings so that my morning, man, I, you know, I've won the day. Yeah. I got that from Michael Hyatt years ago when he talked about his process for writing a blog post. This is probably like 2012, 13. He said the night before I write you know, I think, or maybe it was like a couple of days before he writes like the bullet points 
and he maybe writes like the intro sentence mm -hmm. and then he just lets it go. And it's like, you don't realize your brain is somehow processing that. And so I know for us, we do our content planning meetings. And this is one of the big things that I got, I got out of what you just said was having any kind of a starting point. So you're totally right. Uh, I don't work out first thing in the morning. I actually work out about four hours after I get up, but it's the same block every day. It's on my calendar blocked out. It is sacred time. I don't care if Tony Robbins wanted to be interviewed in that. Actually, I'll, I'll take that back. I would, I would just work out earlier, but yeah. you know, like it, it, that's the time that works for me. It's not that first. Because it's a non-negotiable. Yeah, it is. It's a non-negotiable and uh, except for Tony Robbins. Yeah. And, and so, you know, but like for, for me, it's that when I look at this sheet, you know, I'm going to write some email copy this afternoon, for example, when I look at it, we have, you know, our little email brief, which basically says, here's what it's about. Here's any facts that I need to know, you know, like for instance, the Facebook live is at 2 PM tomorrow. You know, like I need to know that when I'm writing the email, cause I'm not going to, I need to know the time, you know, and I need to know, are there any just key points? And so now I sit down, I look at that. Oh, and then the other thing is, is there any inspiration? Like use this, you know, use this email template that we wrote two years ago as the guide for this one, you know, it's all right there. And I mean, I sit down, I write an email in eight minutes, yeah. you know, but if, when I used to start with just, there's an email for July 25th, oh, crap, what is it even about? I don't even know. It's just, I need to yeah. write, I need to send an email. It was a nightmare. It'd take me an hour to write an email, mm -hmm. you know, so. I love, the, I love the fact that you do not work out first thing in the morning. And I challenge a lot of entrepreneurs on this because they, and, and even on the idea of an hour of power or, or some elaborate morning routine, because what I found more often than not is not that working out first thing in the morning makes the entrepreneur better, but working out in the morning is actually a perverse form of procrastination, as I call it. So, you know, you get, you get these people, they wake up and they do a workout and they do gratitude journaling, and free form journaling and watch, you know, Eric Thomas on YouTube. And then they do some Tony stuff and then they do some interpretive dance. And, you know, they got like 19 things that they're doing because there's actually an article on Inc.com called the 14 things successful people do before breakfast. And it's a four and a half hour routine of ridiculousness. And so people are, they're doing all, they're doing all these things. Oh, I heard Tim Ferriss does this and Joe Rogan does that. And, oh, I, I better do what this person does. And, oh my goodness, that'd be great to add that five minute thing. And, and the next thing you know, let's say you've gotten up in the 5 a.m. club. Now it's eight o'clock in the morning and you're like, holy crap, I got this meeting at nine o'clock. I'm not prepared for it. I've got this mm -hmm. other thing. Oh my goodness. And it's a day of activity and not accomplishment. So yeah. I grew up on a farm, Matt, and I call my morning routine as the farm boy morning miracle. You get up and you go to work, you know, yeah. like here's this revolutionary idea. And I work out, like I'll actually work out after, after this because, you know, it's almost noon. It'll be almost noon here in Vancouver. And okay, I've won the day and I've got some stuff to do this afternoon, but this is when I do the workout because to me, I'm, I'm going to make time for it. Mm-hmm but I'm not going to make time for the hardest thing. I'm not going to eat that frog as Brian Tracy said at two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to eat that frog first thing in the morning. Yeah. I think there's also just something to be said for that's when your brain, I mean, your brain's like, if you're an entrepreneur, your brain is itching to go to work. Mm -hmm. Your brain is itching to do that creative stuff. You know, you write a chapter in a book or you write an email or whatever, you know, you do some something creative where our brain's not desiring to meet first thing in the morning. Um, by you. I, I would there, there, there's a book by Daniel Pink. I think it's called the when the, the perfect scientific time for mm. doing everything. And he says in the morning, you have the greatest discipline, willpower and intention, discipline, yeah. willpower and intention. Because again, if, if you, if you wake up and like, like, let's say you have to write a sales letter, which is tough for a lot of people. Well, if you say, ah, I'll do it after I get motivated or I'll do it after I do some stuff yeah, or won't. whatever. No, you won't. You won't. And you'll be looking at the same thing tomorrow. Well, I'll do it later. The next thing you know, because there's no consequences to not doing it right now, it just pushes something back a little bit. And so you negotiate with yourself. Bedros talks about this a lot in his books and stuff. He, uh, you, you, I'm going to use the B word because technically it's not swearing because it's a female dog, but you negotiate with your inner bitch, as he says. And, and like, it just pushes you like, it's like when he ran a marathon, he's, he's like, you're negotiating every mile to quit. 
every month, like, oh my goodness, I feel a little bit of a pain in my calf. Maybe I should quit, you know? And, and yeah. anytime anybody's done anything, like I do this one thing that I do a fast on the first of every month, 24 hours. So really it's like 36 because it's like from 8 p.m. the night before to about 8 a.m. on the second. And I only did it because I, I read David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me. And I'm like, I don't want to take up endurance running. What else can I do to challenge myself and push myself through? And so, okay, I like eating. So I'm not going to eat on the first and, you know, it'll be too, it'll be like now, you know, we're getting near the first of the, of the month, like in a week or so. And I'm already thinking, well, like last month, actually, uh, it was July 1st, which is Canada day, which is our July 4th, essentially. And my girlfriend and I were like, we were traveling, we're driving to my sister's cottage that day. And we're like, well, maybe we'll just do it on the 30th or, or maybe we'll do it, you know, from like 7 PM till 7 PM the next and I'm like, no, that's not how it works. We don't, we're already negotiating uh, with our inner weaknesses so mm -hmm. far in advance. And, and if, it's, if it is negotiable, you'll, you'll negotiate yourself out of it. And then, uh, as a lot of people say, when you break promises to yourself, your self-confidence goes down. And that's when you start to find yourself in a rut in a lot of areas of life. No, that's, that's so true. It's, I mean, to me, that's the beauty of a non-negotiable. It, it just... It, it became, it's not like we have thousands of them, you know, that we think about. We, pro we probably have a core, I don't know, six. <laughs> I would say so. I would say it's a handful. Yeah. Like, I you mean, know, like my mom has a non-negotiable. Every Sunday she goes to church. Like that's like you don't think about it. It's just non-negotiable and it's an automatic habit or, you know, that she does this or does this or does this. Like you, everybody has them. Most people just, just haven't formalized them or thought about like, yeah, that is a non-negotiable for me. And if I have that, then I can have other, maybe I can add one or two non-negotiables, which will really be supportive for my goals in life. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, you know, Jocko Willing says, you know, discipline equals freedom. There's a certain level of freedom in, you know, one of my non-negotiables is I don't eat sugar. You mm -hmm. know, I just, I just don't, it just makes it easy for me. Like it's not even a, I remember about two months in was the moment I walked, we walked into a candy shop to get some stuff for other people. And I remember going, Oh gosh, I'm going to be so, okay, come on, yeah. willpower. And I walked in and I was like, Hmm, I'm, I'm good. You know, it was like, I realized I'd reached that point. I went through the two months of like willpower, 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 willpower. And then finally I was like, wait, Nope, this is just a non-negotiable for me. Right. This Cause you changed your identity. Yeah, exactly. It was, it just, and it, the thing is it made it easy where it's like, if you're a person who doesn't have that non-negotiable, then it, you know, you well, start, yeah. You start yeah. Well, I, I use, I use the story, the story in the book. I use the story of imagine two people that want to lose weight going to a backyard cookout mm -hmm. and you know, they're, they're giving out cheeseburgers like they're candy, but one of the, the people is a vegan. Well, the vegan is going to say, no, I just don't, I don't eat meat, you know? So I'm, I'm fine. And the other person will go, I'm not, I'm trying not to. And, you know, like after a couple more times that the burgers coming around, they're going to give in. And yep. I mean, that's a very simple, simplistic way of looking at it, but it is, it's just a total switch that you have flipped inside of your head that you don't do X. You just don't under any circumstances. And, and now you don't have to rely on that discipline, willpower and intention because the, this is the identity and therefore I do not do it. Yeah. I mean, that's not, uh, that doesn't make life not worth living. It just really actually makes life a lot easier. I found because, know? because if you look at your brain as an operating system, like a computer operating system, if everything requires a decision and this goes back to like why Steve jobs wore the black turtleneck, right? Yeah, I don't exactly. have time to make a decision about what I'm wearing. I'm going to wear a black turtleneck every day. Therefore, you know, it's like when you run 19 programs on your phone or your computer, it's slow because mm -hmm. everything's using a bit of that CPU. Now, if you have automatic decisions for certain things, I get up at X time, I wear this, like I personally eat the same thing at breakfast and the same thing at lunch every single day. And I make it the same way. So I don't have to think and I'm just, you know, back to business. And so it's not like, well, you know, you have to stare and sit in front of the fridge and stare and you're like, oh, well, I, I want that, but I don't have it here. So maybe I'll go get it and you're wasting time. It's just decision made onto the other stuff that needs more CPU. Yeah, I love that. That's actually a great, I don't know if I call it a hack, but it is a great, it's a great hack. Because um, I think, uh, you know, I, 
I feel like it's the same with like Netflix. You know, it's like the, the studies have shown that like people spend something like 82 hours a year deciding what to watch on Netflix. Really? And like 82 hours. Like that is that. And then I'm like, wait a minute, we spent 20 minutes just last night, you know, <laughs> like trying yeah. to figure out what to watch instead of just thinking, okay, we're just going to like, there's three possibilities. Boom, pick one. Let's go. You know? Uh, so I love that. So as we wrap up again, cause as we, as we mentioned earlier, I want to be respectful of your time uh, and my time. Um, Craig, so two questions as we wrap up here. Number one, especially during this time when things are different, you know, like it's, it's, it's one thing if you're working from home and the kids are in school. It's another thing if the kids are home and you're still going to an office. But right now we have this situation that, you know, many, you know, people are 47 years old and have never experienced something like this. Uh, you know, they've gone through 25 years of routine and now their routine's completely just gone to crap. And then you've got some of them have a teenager and some of them have, you know, two year olds, some of them have, you know, whatever, like there's this mix of age ranges and all this stuff and, and careers and stuff. Where does, where is the balance right now um, between like discipline and, and, and routine and, and giving yourself grace for if, cause I mean, the reality is your routine probably has changed, especially if you've got kids. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't know exactly where that balance is going to be, but I'll say of the most, obviously grace is important, but routine will set you free. Routine will set you free. I, I say structure equals freedom. Jocko says discipline equals freedom. Routine can equal freedom. So I've, I've talked to one of my uh, clients and friends. We actually did a podcast on how to homeschool your kids and when all of this started because she's been homeschooling for five years and she said, the most important thing is that the kids want routine. Yeah. If anybody owns a dog, you know that the dog wants routine. And scientifically, our bodies want routine. Our bodies want to eat at the same time every day. They function best if they eat at the same time every day, relatively eating the same thing every day, going to sleep at the same time every night. In the book, Why We Sleep, I forget the guy's name who wrote it, but he's, he said, if there's only one thing you change in your entire sleep routine, is go to bed at the same time every night and get up at the same time every day. That is the number one most important thing because our bodies crave routine. Mm -hmm. And so if you are thrust into this as many, I mean, all of us have been thrust into this. I mean, it's very unlikely that everybody, except for my friend who I interviewed, Isabel, you know, there's very few people who were, and she lives like in the middle of nowhere, South Carolina, where she barely sees anybody. So there are very few people that were already working at home. Their spouse was working at home. Their business didn't change. And they were already homeschooling kids. Like yeah. she's like one in a billion. But so everybody had some aspect of it. And so you look at what's the biggest problem now. And, you, and that's causing a lot of stress. And you go, how can we figure out the right routine for this? And, and I was talking to that CFO yesterday. Right now he's going through a little bit of... Um, some stress with, uh, you know, there's some, help, there's, 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 there's troubles in a couple of things. And so I'm like, okay, look at, look at what makes that situation better. Scientific method here. Every single day we're putting ourselves through an experiment. So when you do this, does this improve the relationship with this person? If yes, do more of it. And if it backfires and does less, do less of it. And you should be able to go back just in your mental notes and go, well, every time uh, I do this, then this works. And, and, you know, as hokey as it is, if, if somebody has a relationship problem, just go back to the five love languages. You might've read that book. You yeah. might've think, well, that doesn't work. It works. Trust me. So go back to your five love languages, start implementing that routine. Then, you know, your routine, get on it as quickly as possible. You got to take care of yourself first. If you're sticking to your routine as much as, as you can, it's going to be less stressful on you and you're going to be able to bear other people's stresses as they go through the scientific method and find the right routine for them and so on and so forth. And so don't overwhelm yourself at first, just try and fix one thing at a time and that will make a big difference. Hopefully you've had some big breakthroughs already because we've been at this a while, but if you're still working on finding the solutions it is through routine. Yeah. Love it, man. Well, well said indirectly, you answered my last question. So with that, uh, and again, to be respectful of both of our time, we'll wrap up here. Uh, now everyone's going to say, what was that last question? Ah, you'll never know. You'll never uh, know. There you go. So uh, I want to, I want to call people to action. Where can people get a copy? I think, I think people need, uh, the book is great. And I'll just say that 
um, I'm assuming that the, the kit, you know, your life's work in a box costs more than the book. You know, no. yeah. So if you're in like a really tight budget, you'll get a lot out of the book. Please go grab the book. We'll put a link in the show notes. But where can people or can people still get the, the kit? Is that, is that available? Yeah, we, we now we might even have an upgraded version or a, okay. you know, a new version since, uh, since you got yours. It's just perfectdayformula.com. Okay. So guys go to perfectdayformula.com. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, check out Craig's stuff, grab you a kit. Uh, do me a favor, take a picture of you with your kit. When you get in the mail, tag us on social media, let us know you got it. And, um, I'll just say that I've, I've got something for everybody who gets the kit. I can't do it for everybody who gets just the book, but for everybody who gets the kit, I've got a little bonus. Uh, I'm just going to tell you it's awesome. And I've only shared it with our, with our private mastermind, but we're going to share that with you guys. So go grab yourselves a kit or a copy of the book. And Craig, uh, man, thank you so much for being here today. This was awesome. Awesome. Happy to help. Thank you so much for listening today. Remember to check out all of our deep dives into affiliate marketing at theaffiliateguide.tv. And if you have a question, ask it at asktheaffiliateguide.com. Who knows? Maybe you even be featured on an upcoming episode. And lastly, if you haven't yet, make sure to leave a rating and review wherever you're listening to this episode. See you soon.